It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. On Tuesday, August 9th, President Putin of Russia and President Erdogan of Turkey met in St. Petersburg to repair relations that had become frayed after Turkey shot down a Russian fighter jet near the Syrian-Turkish border last November. Following this incident, Russia had imposed sanctions on Turkey and trade and tourism were seriously affected. Erdogan later apologized to the families of the military men involved in the crash. The meeting was set also after July 15th coup attempt against President Erdogan. President Putin was the first international leader to express support for Erdogan, and Erdogan seemed to suspect the U.S. of having a hand uh, against him in this coup d'etat. Speculation was rife that perhaps Erdogan was ready to switch sides from his alliance to the West to a closer relationship with Russia. However, a major stumbling block remains, which is the two countries' dra dramatically opposed positions with uh, in regard to Syria. Now joining me to discuss all of this is John Helmer. John is the longest continuously serving foreign, foreign correspondent in Russia and the only Western journalist to direct his own bureau independent of national or commercial ties. I thank you so much for joining us, John. Thank you, Shamini. So, John, uh, give us a, a bit of a take on what exactly happened at this meeting. I know you are opposed to what the Western press has been reporting. I wouldn't say I oppose. I simply know what happened. And the Western press is uh, completely misleading itself as to what happened. To a three-letter word. It was a dud. And it was uh, a failure, total failure, on the part of the Turkish side to achieve it any sign of uh, a rapprochement or an improvement in relations with Russia. To give you an idea of just how bad it was, the Russian Foreign Ministry has yet to put on its website any acknowledgement that during Tuesday, the Foreign Minister of Russia met a Turk. Instead, the only things indicated of importance to the Foreign Ministry of Russia that occurred on Tuesday were a were, was a telephone call between Foreign Minister Lavrov and the German Foreign Minister, Mr. Steinmeier. So what happened was, uh, let me say, try and say it quickly for you, a lot of expectation built up by the Turks that, uh, to, uh, to, for Washington and Berlin to take care and to be uh, more supportive of Mr. Erdogan as he tries to continue fighting his coup in Turkey with... Uh, hundreds if not thousands if not a hundred thousands of arrests purges of the military the the, bureau, the state bureaucracy and so forth and a total uh, reconstruction of, of uh, political power in that country the coup in turkey didn't end on july the 16th um it's continuing and erdogan needs to reinforce his power domestically he needs to begin to promise to deliver um, economic payoffs to his policies when um, the major economic constituencies of the country, the farmers, the exporters, the energy distributors and so forth, can only see uh, weakness in their currency, weakness in their financial balance sheets and so on. So he, he's, Erdogan promises big. He's uh, also trying to achieve more uh, bribery from the European Union to stop uh, refugee flows. He tries to uh, attract bribes from the United States by making a conspiracy theory of U.S. Uh, intervention in his country, etc., etc. And uh, this idea that there would be a, a complete change in Turkish strategic alliance is nonsense. It was a Turkish bluff. And the rug dealers had the rug pulled from underneath him by himself. He uh, showed up in Moscow. Sorry, go on. <laughs> okay. And uh, John, um, so uh, give us a sense of uh, what Russia's interests are in this meeting. Okay. I mean, although it was uh, downplayed, they did uh, have the meeting with Erdogan, and they were the first to acknowledge and provide some support to Erdogan after the coup. Uh, we know no the support. No, no, that's not quite right. Uh, Russian policy is for s stability on its borders, its neighbors. Russia does not uh, ha consider its uh, national interests, its security interests, its border stability 
to to be advanced advanced if there are coups and revolutions in countries around the neighborhood whether that's the ukraine the u.s uh, did sponsor a coup in kiev in february 2014 whether it's in iran whether it's in north korea whether it's in china or whether it's in turkey so the russian position was uh, stability in the neighborhood the russian position was mr erdogan's the elected constitutional leader of that country and what was happening was an attempt to kill him overthrow him so russian position was stability in the neighborhood that was the russian position it was stated rather quicker than mr kerry was capable of stating it when it when he was trying to put some money on uh, on whoever was the winner and wasn't sure who would be the winner but the russian position really simple it's good neighbor policy if you like but let me try and make it quick and short for you first turkey should stop supporting and fueling and providing safe haven and supplies for groups that threaten russia to the north threaten syria to the south threaten iraq to the east that means an end to support for isis it means an end to uh support for the chechen uh rebellion in the russian caucasus it means an end to turkish support for crimean tartar opposition to russia it means an end to uh turkish support for the war against armenia that's number one number two russia has always for the last several hundred years as long as there are ships and as long as there's the sea want uh, russia wants free passage through the so-called turkish straits between the black sea the aegean sea and the mediterranean the turks claim that it's a territorial water have often claimed that they lost several wars over this uh, russia wants to see no expansion of nato or enemy operations naval operations in the black sea facilitated through the bosphorus through the dardanelles through the turkish straits at the behest and at the permission and encouragement of the turkish government those are security issues right no no response from erdogan in fact he said at the meetings at the press conference we didn't even talk about syria we'll talk about that a bit later in the afternoon but as for that meeting there's no record that anything was said because as i said before the the turkish uh, the russian foreign ministry has yet to acknowledge there was such a meeting more important on the morning of the day no, no, john was, but there oh, was a post uh, meeting uh, press conference that took place both presidents yes. did make a, a statement uh, president putin actually made reference to what you were just talking about which is that uh, uh, you know uh, that russia categorically opposed any sort of uh, uh, unconstitutional or uh, coup d'etats of this nature, um, some yes. interpreted that uh, to be also uh, perhaps a reference to Syria and, uh, uh, and Bashar al-Assad. Yes. Um, so there was some uh, official references to this. What uh, then did they say in the meeting? And what was your takeaway? Well, uh, let me go back a minute. On the morning of Erdogan's arrival in St. Petersburg, there's a 30-minute interview he gave to Russian state television, to the TASS news agency, in which he made a number of statements which he didn't repeat in his press conference. He uh, called again for the overthrow of Bashar al-Assad. He again explicitly referred to support for the Crimean Tatars in their opposition to Crimea's accession to the Russian Federation. Now, th those are two very big... Uh, no-nos, negatives, uh, aggressive remarks to make on the eve of your arrival in Russia so that there was nothing left to discuss when he got there. Instead, there's a lot of talk about talking, a lot of talk about talking about the future economic relations between the two countries, the reinstate revival of the two gas pipeline projects, uh, Turkish Stream and South Stream for Gazprom, uh, the revival of the uh, nuclear reactor project, which is Russia is building at Akuyu, uh, talk about reviving investment, talk about improving visa conditions for Turkish workers in Russia. On none of those things, none of those things was any agreement announced. 
all the sides did, all the presidents said at their press conference, was that they agreed to continue talking. And for all Mr. Erdogan's dear friend Putin, a uh, remark he kept making roughly, I timed him every three to four minutes of the time he's in front of a camera. Nobody believes it. And he didn't offer anything on which the Russian side could say, we've reached a new stage. He did, he, yes, he apologized for the shoot down of the SU-24, but he did not offer Turkish compensation for the murdered pilot, uh, uh, Captain Peskov. It was very clear Russian policy that Turkey should pay compensation, just as it's been Turkish policy that Israel should pay compensation for the killing of Turkish citizens uh, in a, a famous uh, vessel uh, incident off the Gaza coast several years ago. Turkey insisted on compensation from Israel. It took years. It's been achieved. Yet Turkey offers no compensation when Russia has insisted on, on little issues, on big issues. Erdogan offered nothing. And uh, John, what now um, in terms of moving forward with these uh, two countries uh, who are very pivotal and very strategically located in terms of the Syrian conflict? Well, I wouldn't say the word direction is forward. From a Greek point of view, uh, there is increasing chaos. Greek and Cypriot point of view, there's increasing chaos in Turkey, around Turkey. And from one point of view, that's, potential, that's a small positive because it makes the Turkish army less capable of expanding aggressively east, south, or west. There's no improvement on Turkey's readiness to reach a solution for the withdrawal of, of troops from northern Cyprus, illegally there since the invasion of 74. There's no sign that, um, that uh, Turkey will, rel will relent in its support for the overthrow of Syria. There's no sign that Turkey will do anything to uh, remove the Chechen threat to Russia inside Turkey. So um, we're going to move sideways. We're going to move, we'll simply watch and see if Mr. Erdogan himself can survive. But the way he describes his survival is that he's the democratic leader of Turkey. Well, that's true. He produces these uh, street displays of uh, public support. And uh, at the same time, he distrusts his own military forces so much that he not only purges the generals, general staff, he couldn't bring a military officer to his in his delegation to Moscow uh, yesterday. Not one military officer does Mr. Erdogan trust enough to bring to the party in Moscow, uh, sorry, in St. Petersburg. The and, chief uh, of the Russian general staff was there, but no Turkish counterpart officer. Now, um, finally, uh, John, uh, do we at this point know what the Russian intelligence knew about the coming coup in Turkey? All we know is uh, telephone intercepts. What we know is that all major intelligence organizations follow what happens in Turkey. So they're all listening to military communications, some are in the open, some uh, encrypted. Knowing and listening doesn't mean that you're assisting in what's happening. Uh, I think we said on this program before, the Turks themselves engaged in the putsch didn't know what was happening with their own comrades across Istanbul town. So uh, foreign intelligence services, whether they were the United States or the Russian, were watching and listening, but not. But I don't believe controlling. And uh, the situation is right now, everybody continues to do sit in their bunkers and watch and listen. But Mr. Erdo Erdogan, if he thought he came to Russia to prove that he's in charge, proved that he's not, not even in charge of his own mouth. All right, John, I thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to uh, ongoing reports from you. Thank you very much. Me too. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.